Hey, hey. Uh, there's some seats up here. Oh, come on, come on, come, come on, come on, come on. You holding up the whole thing now, might as well. Come on, sit down. All right, so actually, um, what I'm going to do is start with a film. Um, and I'm going to start with a film. It's a short film. It's like seven, eight minutes. It's a mini documentary. Um, I'm going to start with this because the work that I do um, in, on this topic really is um, meant to be in the service of folks who are experiencing this in ways that I don't, right? And so what I want to start with instead of me um, interpreting or explaining what's at stake um, with these schools is I want to start with a resident of Chicago, a grandmother, um, who in a short documentary can sort of sketch out for you um, the why and how that it matters. And then um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about where the project came from in just one of the, the chapters, right? We're going to be hit it and quit it and out in an hour. So while that may sound like a lot, <laughs> it's really not going to be. The critical conversation meeting about Bessie DeVos. My name is Irene Robinson. I'm a grandma of 18 grandchildren and a mother of six. I have been in Chicago all my life. I lived here all my life. This was my first apartment when I moved uh, by myself with my children. The school was not just a learning center for the children. It had uh, resources for the parents. We, we cooked there. We had um, holiday meals there with the children and the parents. We had GED classes in our school for the parents. I used to walk my grandbabies to school every day as I walked my children to the same school until every one of them graduated. But I still didn't leave the school. I was still here because that's where my heart was. I was a young parent when I moved here. And the teachers here helped me. They educated me more than what I was educated on. They, they, they nurtured me when I needed it because I was a single, single mom with five children. Anthony Overton was a good school and, and, and it had always been supported for the community and children and parents until the sabotage had started coming in. By the time my children started having children and my grandchildren started coming there, where it was already in plan to sabotage it, to starve it, and to close it. So when you starve the school by taking resources, by taking the maintenance work, by taking teachers and taking programs out of the school, you starve in that school to a point where there's nothing there to, for the children to receive. Because this school is underutilized now, and this school is in poor condition. That means the upkeep is in poor condition, and the test scores is failing. So they used those three um, reasons to close up a school. We protest. We went to the alderman. We went to board meeting. We did everything that a parent and her power and their power can do. The resistance was so no one wanted to hear about keeping Anthony Overton open or none of the rest of the school. Who got grandma? Fight, fight for the this is one of the Overton baby ribs. Oh, here I see we opened diet up. Yeah, we opened it. All the funding was taken from our neighborhood school and sucked right into charter schools, which half of our children can't go to, which is not 
parent friendly, which is not what the parents wanted. You know what they did to um over to them? What? Made they made it to, um, to a record. They, the, these people own it. They own the jump. Well, they own the whole thing, but they made the jump to a record. Really? And it's not for the public. I'm finna walk over there. You know what? They're going to pay for that. They closed it down and they sold it. Oh, they sold it? They sold it. When they closed Anthony Overton and put um, half of the children in Madison and half in Burt, they sold it. So we, that, that don't mean that we lost. That means we're going to get a bigger and better school, right? right. And we're going to design it even better. I know right now it's looking like we ain't going to win, but we're going to win. We're going to get those we schools get back. School. That's right, my king. You know it too, right? As long as grandmama got breath in her, I'm going to continue to fight. And people going to come, and more people going to come. And the more I come, guess what's going to happen? We gonna get what we got, what was stolen from us. Okay, I love y'all. I have to go. Give me her. I love you. There's a silent, well, I won't say silent, invisible way that they use hate crimes. When they say privatizing, when they say closing schools, they they use it as we gonna close to improve. But no, you're not. Privatizing was the death of our neighborhood school. The pain is still, but I know I can't stop because I have to fight. I guess I hurt in, in more than one way because I hurt for my peoples. The history of my peoples I hurt for, and I hurt for my grandchildren and children who don't have a chance of getting the opportunity. It feel like a, as a parent, we supposed to protect our children. My little, my grandbaby Mikey, after all that was over, he looked at me one day and he told me he had got so upset, he told me, you lied to me, Grandmama. You told me that we was going to get our school back and I hate going to Madison. Do you know how that made me feel? Because I couldn't, I couldn't protect them. When the school closed, our children fought it did they self. They felt like they was too dumb. You know how many times I have to tell children, you're not dumb. You're smart. It wasn't your fault. You can't. That's why I called everybody kings and queens. My young kids, I called them that. When you take away their self-esteem and degrade them, and it's just over and over and over, when it's going to stop? When they close in the school, what they really saying is, we don't want your child to have an education. We don't want you in the community. And we can take these schools. And there's nothing you can do about it. That's what they really saying. Do we care if your child is going to be in danger? No. Only thing we care about is making money even if it's off the back of your children. And this country is responsible for that.
All right, so as I told you, part of the reason that I wanted to start with that is it matters what voices we bring in the room, right? And this work, more than other work that I've done, really is about a pressing social issue um, that people need help with. But I also start with that because one of the narratives that I ended up speaking back to in writing this book was about how people would say that uh, black communities don't care about education. That education is something that a lot of the, when I was working on this, there was a um, scholar named Jeff Ogbar who, who was saying that, you know, black kids thought that getting a good education was acting white. Um, and this supposed lack of interest on the part of black communities, supposed, um, because it, 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 this is a lovely film, but the, you, you can multiply her uh, in every community by uh, exponentially. There are, the book that, that, that I did, although I'm gonna talk about the present today, I went back to the 1890s and I can tell you there's never been a period in American history when poor folks and people of color weren't willing to do whatever it would take to make sure that their babies got educated, never. And so it is, a, it is almost a hate crime, as, as uh, the, the woman in here says, that you can use, that you can, that you can take what we know to be true um, and turn it inside out as a way to demolish communities and make a profit. Right? And so a lot of what I talk about in the book, in that eight minutes, really, she did it all for me. <laughs> um, all of the issues, many of the issues, she just in the present, and again, I started a little early, I started a lot earlier, but uh, what it looks like, what it feels like, and why it matters, um, I think is, is there. But I also wanted to start with that because the beginning of this project started in a college classroom. Um, I was, at Princeton working on a multi-year project uh, partnership with the Trenton Public Schools. For a lot of the kids who were in this freshman seminar, um, these freshman seminars are, uh, all students are required to take one and they're supposed to be basically like engaged uh, research and learning. You have to do something with the students and everybody's take one in. Um, and so this one was about school and urban education. Bunch of freshmen, um, most of whom had never been in an urban school district. If they went to public schools, um, their schools were high performing. Um, they had not been in the kinds of schools like, uh, that exist in the Chicago neighborhood. Um, and they certainly hadn't been in schools like Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, and one of the things that made the class popular was, and y'all can come up front, come on, come on, come on. Um, one of the things that made the class popular is in the culture at the time. In 2009, all of this stuff started jumping off that led, or started happening, that led people to believe that they had some real understanding um, of what's going on in urban school districts, right? So I just listed a couple of them. There's this film, Waiting for Superman, that came out in 2009. It is a story about how horrible it is in urban communities that public schools are doing so poorly, and as a result, we need to privatize them, we need charter schools. Basically, just to strip down what the story is about. It's really melodramatic. Any folks who do film, like if you pull that film apart, Imitation of Life got nothing on it. It is melodrama of the highest order. Um, but it led people to believe, like I'm seeing into a community, a way of life, a set of issues that I knew nothing about. Um, at the same time, Barack Obama announced a new federal program called Race to the Top, um, which, which basically incentivized states to take on a lot of these privatized actions. It made, it made what had been um, something that folks were talking about into federal policy. So all of a sudden, closing underperforming schools opening charter schools, hiring a alternatively certified teaching corps like Teach for America teachers, um, firing long-term teachers that were in these districts. This became a part of federal policy, but it was also much like uh, 
Waiting for Superman was presented as a help. So people in these communities are watching schools be dismantled, um, are watching their realities be narrated. Um, it's becoming this big, huge cultural moment, and yet their voices were not the ones that were leading the conversation. They're coming from the outside politicians and uh, politicians, the arts. Then Mark Zuckerberg in 2009, really this was the year, uh, gave $100 million to the North Public Schools. And he announced it on the Oprah Winfrey show. And um, Cory Booker, our, our, he's a senator now, at the time he was the mayor of Newark, was there. And it was like this big thing. We're going to fix it. We have five years, $100 million, everything we need to fix the problems that are, that are in uh, struggling urban areas. And all of the, the fixes were exactly like what you saw in Waiting for Superman and, and Race to the Top. We needed newer, different kinds of teachers. We needed more charter schools. We needed more virtual education. We needed uh, less regulation for privatized schools, like all of it. So it was really, you know what else? Oh, and then on the campus of Princeton, uh, a group called Students for Ed Reform was founded. Um, that, that was two freshmen. They had never been in any of these kinds of community schools. Their fathers were hedge funders. The hedge funder, literally, like I'm saying it with a little sneer in my voice, but this is a literal recitation of what happened. Their hedge funder fathers were like, well, we hear that there's this big business going on in, in ed reform. There's charter schools and there's, you know, you should do something with that. You should get in on the front page of that. They, they took a year off from school after having raised $40 million as freshmen with zero experience. <laughs> with zero, they, the year before, they didn't even know that public education exists, like that, that trouble schools you know, it existed. And yet, it becomes this real opportunity. And so everybody on campus is kind of like, what about me? Like, well, you know, maybe I can get a hedge fund, right? So, uh, and the last thing is, in this class, uh, we talked about all of these things as the backdrop, but we talked about what are called 90-90-90 schools. 90-90-90 schools are the sweet spot for charter school organizations, for charter management organizations. Um, they're 90% below federally set poverty levels, 90% of color, uh, and 90% are not meeting benchmarks, right, educational benchmarks. That people were talking about openly, writing to each other, you know, about that's the sweet spot, that's what we need, right, to open. And between these bright-eyed children, um, who were wonderful, they were wonderful, it was a great class, it was wonderful, it went on for three years, like they didn't stick with it for three years, but the project and the partnership lasted for three years and they got it started. Um, but one of the things that stuck in my mind from teaching the class was the extent to which I had never noticed that all of this really depended on really high levels of racial and economic segregation in order to work, right? This is a business model um, that doesn't, it can't function in the absence of really high levels of racial and economic segregation. And I started to wonder if perhaps one of the reasons uh, we have such a hard time addressing segregation in the country is that there's money to be made from it, right? And I recognize that I didn't know the answer, that I didn't know enough. That I, and so this book really is my attempt to answer that question that came out of this class. So I'm gonna just, um, I'm gonna actually read to you because otherwise I'll talk too long. Um, but this is from one portion, one half of one chapter um, to give you a sense. In 2011, a Cuban immigrant named Hamlet Garcia and his wife, Olesia, enrolled their five-year-old daughter, Fiorella, in a largely white and affluent school in the suburbs of Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Before the move, the child was to have attended a lower performing school in Philadelphia. The couple were having marital problems that became severe enough for Olesia to move out of their Philadelphia home and take their daughter with her to her father's house. In March of 2012, the couple reconciled and moved back to Philadelphia, though the kindergartner finished the year at the suburban school. A month later, the school district contacted the couple to dispute their residency, and that August, they were told they were facing arrest. 
The criminal complaints sworn out against them said that the Garcias stole $10,000, which was the per pupil cost of one year at the Montgomery County Public School their daughter had attended. The dollar amount made the charge a felony with a potential prison sentence of seven years. Rather than face the ordeal of a trial and the possibility of conviction, the couple accepted a plea bargain and agreed to pay the district close to $11,000, as well as $70,000 in legal fees. This is just one example of the extent to which education is not only seen as a valuable commodity because it promises social mobility and lucrative employment, it's also a possession with a specific dollar figure attached, owned by the wealthy and all too often denied to those who are not. For that reason, cases of so-called educational theft, like that of the Garcia family, exemplify the economic impact of segregation on communities seeking to escape apartheid education. Just as underperforming, highly racially and economically segregated urban schools constitute a lucrative opportunity for some in business to educate students impacted by poverty, high performing schools in wealthy areas are a valuable asset they feel is worth protecting with incarceration if it comes to that. This is how it came to be that between 2012 and 2016, parents in Connecticut, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, and Missouri were all arrested and stood trial for stealing education. This particular phenomena is now so common that on either coast and in many places in between, school districts have begun to hire special investigators to follow, photograph, and film children as they go from home to school and back again. This surveillance helps school school officials determine if all the students who show up day after day are legally permitted to attend. The desire to keep poor and often non-white children out of wealthy schoolhouses has even spawned a new business. It's districts in Florida, Pennsylvania, California, and New Jersey that don't want to spend the money to hire full-time investigators have contracted with companies promising lower cost ways of verifying student addresses. With names like VerifyResidents.com, such companies, according to one website, provide the latest in covert video technology and digital photographic equipment to photograph, videotape, and document children going from their house to school. For school districts willing to invest even more, other companies offer a rewards pro program, giving anonymous tipsters $250 checks for reporting out-of-district students. The consequences for parents and students caught in this web are devastating and can include tens of thousands of dollars in fees, jail time, and felony convictions that preclude them from voting and gaining future employment. This is what happened in the spring of 2012 when a judge in Connecticut sentenced a black mother, Tanya McDowell, to 12 years in prison for stealing education for her kindergarten age son. Education officials in Connecticut said that her son should have enrolled in the city of Bridgeport, not the wealthy town of Norwalk. McDowell and her son at the time were homeless when she was arrested for educational theft. They split their time between a homeless shelter in Norwalk, the home of her babysitter, Anna Marquez, in Norwalk, and sometimes if there was no room elsewhere in the back seat of her minivan. In order to even enroll her son in school, she used her babysitter's address, which was in a public housing complex in Norwalk. When school officials discovered that the kindergartner was not what they considered a legal resident of Norwalk, they could have simply asked McDowell to remove him from school. That's what they had done with the 20 or so other students found to have been illegally enrolled that year. In this case, however, officials decided to prosecute this black single homeless parent on first degree lar larceny charges that carried a maximum sentence of up to 20 years in prison. School district officials admitted that they treated her far more harshly than they ever had anyone else because they wanted to make an example of her. They said they didn't want their community to be seen as welcoming to other parents who might want to provide their children with an education to which they were not entitled. In that regard, Bridgeport is a microcosm of many cities where the migration of wealthy whites and their tax dollars to the suburbs 
has had devastating consequences for the people left behind. As such, this case makes clear the links to which some would go to make sure the drawbridge allowing access to their schools is quickly and securely pulled up behind them after they are safely ensconced on the other side. In relation to urban education, school reform, and the difficulties involved in navigating the caste-defining realities of apartheid education, this case and the situation of Bridgeport schools in general are a distillation of history made present. The educational impact of poverty and racial and economic segregation on Bridgeport, Connecticut's largest city, has been evident since at least 1961. At that time, they were just beginning their transfer, transformation into an abysmal state. The trickle of whites moving out of other towns and cities with their tax dollars was not yet the rushing river would become a few years later. By the 1990s, 20% of residents and a quarter of the children in Bridgeport lived in poverty. As is so often the case, poverty breeds other ills. According to Pastor Kenneth Mawalas, a former school board member, quote, in the city of Bridgeport, we have 18 schools that are failing. Of those, 13 have been failing for the last 10 years. The children in Bridgeport are educated in a system with few students who are white or wealthy. With that history as context, it's easy to see how a homeless black mother might risk everything to ensure a quality education for her child, as well as easy to understand the reasons why authorities would struggle mightily to keep her out. If she were allowed to stay, others might follow. The fears on both sides are as much about education as they are about economics. However, economics is a driving force. The Bridgeport, in 2011, the Bridgeport school spent about $10,000 per pupil each year. That number is far less than was spent in wealthy districts in Connecticut and elsewhere. In 2016, Nine states had large disparities between what they spent in wealthy districts and those that are poor. Arizona, Illinois, Missouri, Nevada, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Vermont, and Virginia. When asked about his views regarding how these choices impacted the, children, the education of poor children, former Secretary of Education Arne Duncan said, quote, children who need the most seem to be getting less and less. Children who need the least seem to be getting more and more. There's something unfair and educationally unsound and frankly un-American about what's happening, end quote. The truth of his assertion about how American or not it is for the wealthy to hoard educational funds for their own children and deny them to poor students of color is at the very least up for debate. However, what we know for sure is that Tanya McDowell was charged with stealing $15,686 in educational services for her son. Despite the fact that there had previously been no penalty for so-called educational theft, the Nor Norwalk School Board president, in answering the question of why they seem so intent on prosecuting this one woman, replied, there has to be a penalty for stealing services. Right now, there's none. Their thinking persisted despite the fact that her homelessness should have protected her and her son. Under federal law, children can continue to attend classes in the school district where they began their education if the family becomes homeless at a later point. That made no difference whatsoever. Nor Norwalk's mayor, Richard Moshe, when asked to explain why the family's homelessness didn't lead his administration to follow the law, did not so much answer the question as restate the facts before offering his opinion when he said, quote, this woman was using an illegal address in a public housing complex has a checkered past, and despite all the protestation that she's concerned about her son, if she had done things right, this would never have happened. He did not specify what exactly he wishes McDowell had done more right. And she and her son were not the only casualties in the case. When McDowell enrolled her child in Norwalk's Brookside Elementary School, Anna Marquez, McDowell's babysitter, signed a notarized statement saying the child lived in her public housing unit. In their quest to establish the inviolate boundaries of their schools, school officials passed that statement on to Norwalk Housing Authority officials, who then began eviction proceedings against Marquez for fraud. It would not just be McDowell and her son who would pay a high price for trying to obtain a rigorous education, one that would have been almost impossible within the Bridgeport city limits. On average, 
Black students in Bridgeport, a black student in Bridgeport attends a school with five times the poverty rate attended by the average white student in Connecticut. Two thirds of the city's children are born into families on some form of public assistance. More than half of the neighborhoods in the city have employment rates greater than three times the national average, unemployment rates greater than three times the national average. These are the conditions that led, McDowell, led to McDowell's impossible choice. As a result, the vigor with which prosecutors pursued McDowell attracted national attention. The Connecticut chapter of the NAACP <laughs> hired a lawyer for her and issued a supportive statement that, the, that, quote, the criminalization of parents trying to enroll their child in a better quality school simply to give them a chance for a better life is wrong and should be resolved through civil and not criminal means. The online petition site Change.org collected over 27,000 signatures, urging an end to her prosecution. Public sentiment seemed to have moved in her favor, but then McDowell was arrested on drug charges as a result of an undercover police sting. To the extent that the national outcry over her treatment might have had an ameliorating effect on a harsh sentence following the drug conviction, prosecutors, believing they now had the moral high ground, pressed for a speedy conclusion. They joined the drug and school theft cases and won the right to have them tried together. Given mandatory sentencing minimums, she now faced the potential of serving over 20 years in prison. Instead, she opted for a plea that resulted in a 12-year sentence with parole eligibility after five years. While she served her time, her son lived with his grandmother in Bridgeport and, and attended school in that district. He was said to suffer from frequent nightmares. Though the sentencing in this case is extreme, McDowell and her family are not alone in attracting national attention for attempting to navigate structural barriers impeding black children from receiving a quality education. The so-called crime of educational theft is growing and expanding. The same year McDowell began serving her sentence, a federal judge sen sentenced another single black mother, Kelly Williams Bolar of Cleveland, Ohio, to 10 days in jail three years probation, and 80 hours of community service. Though the governor would subsequently pardon her, pardon her, she was, too was convicted of stealing an education for her children. Sadly, her father was also swept up in the frenzy, was arrested on fraud charges for letting his daughter use his address, and in trying to fight the prosecution, lost his house and ultimately died of a heart attack in jail. The whole case is yet another example of the ways that education and access to a quality, non-segregated, non-apartheid kind of it has become a marker of a socially limiting caste system. Her crime was using her father's address to enroll her children in a predominantly white and wealthy school district in which she did not reside. His crime was helping his grandchildren. Williams Bolar made the choice to find a more stable educational situation in 2006 after there was a break-in in her home in Akron. Though no one was there when the robbery took place, she was nonetheless deeply concerned about her daughters, then 13 and 9. She says this was the first time it occurred to her that she might be able to use her father's address. Not only were the schools where he lived better, but because he was retired, she said, she knew that he would be home to look after the girls while she worked. Though Williams Bolar says the educational quality of the schools were not the primary reason for her decision, the difference between the educational record of Akron schools and that of the Copley Fairlawn School District where her father's house was located is stark. In 2010-11, Akron Public Schools met state prescribed performance goals on just five of 26 categories of performance such as high school graduation and standardized tests, while Copley Fairlawn District met all 26 of its benchmarks. The only way for students to attend a school in the Copley Fairlawn District is to reside within the city limits or pay $9,000 $9, annual tuition. Williams Bolar at the time earned roughly $28,000 a year and couldn't afford that kind of fee, and so she listed her father's address on her daughter's enrollment forms. They attended the district for two years. 
Though she couldn't have known it, the decision to enroll her children came at a time when the district was in the midst of an aggressive war against parents who tried to steal their kids' education. To administrators and many of its parents, people like Williams Bolar simply look like thieves, literally stealing their school with having to con without having to contribute anything to the tax base uh, for the provided services. The residents of those districts say it's not right for them to be expected to subsidize the education of a child whose parents don't pay taxes in the district. They worry about the impact of outside enrollment on class sizes, test scores, and special education programs. They believe these feared changes justified increased vigilance about keeping out families who did not pay taxes. In order to fight back, the school district deployed a range of taxes to to protect what it viewed as an increasingly valuable commodity. Among other things, officials hired private investigators to track parents, and in 2008, they announced a $100 bounty to anyone who turned in an illegally registered parent. Uh, so after her conviction, she served nine days in jail, and the terms of her parole forbade her from drinking and required her to submit to drug tests and to report monthly to a probation officer. She also had to perform 80 hours of community service and pay $800 in restitution, as well as the cost of the Summit County's prosecution against her. Upon her arrest, groups and organizations set up online pet petitions, and together with one organized by a woman in Massachusetts named Caitlin Lord, they garnered 180,000 signatures asking for Governor John Kasich to pardon her. He did so, but the felony conviction remains on her record. The account of Williams Bolar's youngest daughter, Jada, comparing the school district to which she had been assigned with the one to which her mother and grandfather father were able to send her for a few years, harkens back to a pre-Brown v. Board of Education era of sanctioned segregation. She remembers, quote, we had things I would have never even think, never have thought in elementary school would have. We had a computer lab, we had a garden outside, we had our own greenhouse, end quote. As jo Jada recalled the move back to the Akron school, she says, quote, it was a huge difference. It was huge, we didn't learn that much. It was disruptive in class, there were no resources. It was completely different, and I felt like I wasn't learning anything at all. Tellingly, wealthy whites do not end up with felony convictions when they're accused of educational theft. This was the case with a man named Mark Ebner, a Columbus, Ohio parent who illegally enrolled his children in a neighboring suburban school district. The Ebner family's primary residence was a $1 million property just outside the suburban district's borders. When Ebner found out that private investigators were tailing him, he reportedly arranged for a house swap with relatives inside the district. He then sued the district for spying on him. The same year that Williams, Bo Williams, Bolar, and family were engulfed in their court case, the Ebners were able to use their wealth and privilege to evade the grasp of the criminal justice system, and their, chi and their children continued to benefit from attending a higher quality school. Okay, I'm jumping forward. So there's all these other cases in Rochester, and uh, I'm gonna just read one more, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna dismount here. Uh, in 2015, the school district in Orinda, California, made national headlines when officials hired an investigator to spy on the seven-year-old daughter of a nanny. Both lived together near the school in the home of her mother's employers. School officials allowed the little girl to stay in the district only after her mother agreed to make the couple she worked for her daughter's official caregivers. This allowed her employers to enroll her daughter in the school. In Atlanta, a mother of three faced up to 80 years in prison after being charged with 16 counts of falsifying school documents so that her kids, all honor students, could attend better schools in the city rather than in her home district of Cobb County. And there's more. Okay, so as a result, the cycle of hoarding and plundering educational funds earmarked for poor and working class children of color continues uninterrupted, as it has since the 19th century. Again and again, these families learn that race, segregation, and educational policy in this country work against, not for, low-income black and Latino communities. 
At the same time, the wealthy and political elite learn that race, segregation, and educational policy works for them. It shores up their caste status, the speaks moral authority, and ensures financial gain for some, all while whole communities fall further and further behind. We have failed to collectively notice this social arrangement, where increasingly thick walls are erected around certain districts, both allowing and keeping out students based on race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. So this is the context within which I came up with this term, segronomics, um, that refers to both the ways that businesses profit from underperforming school districts by providing edu. The edu business sector in the United States is second only to the healthcare sector in terms of growth right now, right? This is a 500 to $600 billion a year um, enterprise. And every time these businesses shift these funds um, from, from taxpayer dollars to government hands, I mean, to, to private hands, not only are the districts undermined, um, but they're making too much money. Like, you have to ask, what will it take to make the, the potential profit um, not worth it to them. Just by way of comparison, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the um, criminal justice system, incarceration, and the amount of money that's bound up with the ways that we police and jail. All in, if you take everything from bail bondsmen to, to ankle monitoring, to prison guards, to prisons, um, to the janitors, like all in, if you take everything involved with the criminal justice system, you're talking about 80 billion a year, right? Here you're talking five to 600 <laughs> billion. And right now, the, the public education system is majority of color and majority poor right now. And so what that means is the, the kind of social capital that allows folks to push back, to fight back, um, to keep some of these policies from, from happening in their communities, when you're talking about poor folks who are of color, without those kinds of connections, they're just simply vulnerable, right? And so uh, one of the things that, that I always say with this work, I, the, we can talk about it if anybody's of interest, uh, the kind of stuff I've been doing since it was published, but again, it, it's, uh, it is useful for people who are in communities on the front lines fighting battles. Um, and that makes me feel good. So my, my partner made this little video for me as a teaser. He taught himself animation to do it that explains segronomics. So it's just 30 seconds. <laughs> at least 10, 15 minutes worth of questions. If there's anything, anything anybody's interested in hearing more about, yeah, in the back. Um, thank you. It was really shocking. Never heard that before. Um, are there places like, for instance, North Carolina, which bases education? Um, oh, he's trying to hand you the. Oh, thank you. Just, just speak into it like this? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much for that shocking information. Um, are there, do you notice differences around the country, for instance, in North Carolina, where they base the school funding on a general sales tax for the state? Do you see these cases, these horrible cases of, um, of education theft not happening in those states? Yeah, right. Uh, I have not found any cases of educational theft in those states. But what has happened in North Carolina um, is, is they had fabulous uh, anti-integration plans that communities came up with. Um, and white parents said, you know, we think there's a value for our kids 
and the state and everybody and having integrated schools. So we are gonna voluntarily come up with plans that will lead to racial and economic integration in North Carolina. The majority of the parents in the Charlottesville area were on board with this. Um, there was a handful who felt like their rights were being stepped on. Because just because 80% of the parents in North Carolina held these values of integration um, and, and you know, privileging different kinds of groups being together, this 20% was like, yeah, we don't. And why is it exactly that we have to go along with the majority here? What about our rights? And after a series of, of court cases, the Supreme Court actually agreed with them that whatever the idea of uh, integration, the good that it was supposed to bring the country, it was trampling on the individual rights of this community of white folks. And so this hugely successful, people were doing case studies about this. Like these are, this is how you can make integration work. And, the, and the, the, the thing that we know, the only thing that has actually moved the needle substantively is integration. But that's because it gives poor folks access to the money that's being hoarded by wealthy folks. It's not some you know, magical sit by white people and all of a sudden you too will be smart. Like it's just, you have access to stuff that people are keeping from you. Um, and, but once the, the Supreme Court said no, the same thing happened out in Seattle, Washington, group of parents who were saying, yep, we want this. Um, Supreme Court, yeah, no, because there's a little group that do not. And so somehow, when you talk about majority rules, and when you talk about democracy, when, when, you, when you talk about race and poverty in education, really what we're looking at in a, in a um, legal sense is it doesn't, it just doesn't. The, the majority <laughs> of, of folks who in the, the, the cases that I know about have all been white middle class parents, um, the, the, their rights are the ones that predominate. And so North Carolina schools have resegregated aggressively following that, that ruling. Um, schools all across the South have resegregated aggressively because the Supreme Court says you can. Eric, oh, I'm gonna do Eric, and then I'm gonna come. <laughs> Great job, by the way. Thank you. Doing your presentation, it, it just hit me, the whole aspect of echoes of slavery, you know, because, you know, in terms of it being against the law to educate blacks. Mm -hmm. I mean, what those single parents went through, and also the woman in the, in the uh, project that was that was basically forced to be evicted. I don't know if she really was. That, no, she was. It, she was, was. it was such, it, it reminded me of slavery in the sense of the laws that were passed and what went on with black folks then. Mm -hmm. So really good job and thanks for sharing. Thank you. The thing, the thing I'll tell you is so, uh, when I left this class that I started telling you about at Princeton, right, I kept, I was like, so you got philanthropists, you know, the, uh, Zuckerberg, and you've got business entities, you know, this growth of like, you got all these things that are prescribing education to poor communities. And so when I started, I was like, you know, I'm gonna just keep backing up. I kept backing up decade by decade, trying to find a period where that wasn't the case. So I could say, I'm gonna start here and then look at what happened when I don't see all of this happening. That's so what I always say is then I backed into reconstruction. I kept backing up um, and post reconstruct or during the reconstruction period um, is when in the South, you get taxpayer-supported, state-funded education, right? Like, that's where it comes from, with the federal dollars to educate the formerly enslaved. But they couldn't do it and not educate white folks, too. So poor whites um, were, were, for the first time, I mean, education had always been um, something that the wealthy enjoyed. Um, it just didn't occur to anybody to educate the children of farmers, white farmers. Like, nobody was trying to educate black people, but even white folks, right? They were like, why, why, why would we do that? Um, and with these reconstruction dollars, everybody in the region got to be ex educated. But what happens is post-reconstruction, when the federal troops, like that all worked when you have federal troops with guns and stuff, right? Making sure you are going to let people vote. You're going to let them go to school. You're going to, but literally it took federal troops um, to ensure that that happened. When the, after the Hayes Tillich, I'm not gonna turn into a historian, but stuff happened and then they pulled out the troops. It was a compromise. Um, and immediately, Southern governments went after voting and education, and they went after it 
hard. They, 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 you know, came up with, uh, governments in the 13 former slaveholding states came up with all kinds of stuff. Like, you can't use uh, black tax dollars or white tax dollars, even though now we have state-supported taxpayer education, but the white tax dollars cannot be used to educate any black people. Cannot. Matter of fact, we're going to need the black people to, to pay taxes into the system to educate whites, and then we're gonna need them to pay other taxes to educate their own to make sure that there's no, no you know, we don't mess up and start sharing, uh, sharing money. Um, and so, I'm, I'm, I'm just really quickly, so the way that uh, rural black folks, black, most people, black people were rural uh, post-Reconstruction, the way that they ended up getting educated is you had these philanthropists with names like George Eastman, Rockefeller, Dodge, like names you would recognize today, right? Captains of industry with companies. Well, Eastman Kodak doesn't really exist anymore, but they used to make film. Like, but it was like a big, you know, and, and Peabody, and, right? And they all came and they said, you know what? We have a problem. The whole economic growth of the country was based on all this free labor. Like the whole country is benefiting from the fact that the South can be the economic engine because they're not paying anybody to work. Now that, that you know, we're, we're trying to pay, we have to figure out something and, and if we have to give them education in order for them to stay here and work, we can figure out how to pay them as little as possible. We, we can have them work on subsistence levels, but how are you gonna keep them in the region? Education became a tool for that, that all of these philanthropists said, because what we're looking at is with immigration um, busting out in the West and in the North, if we have an educated black citizenry, when it comes time, they're trying to unionize and stuff. They're trying to you know, better themselves. We can take these black folks, if we educate them a little bit and make them compliant, educate them into a social status. This, this is literally, I'm not making it up, they were writing this to each other and to everyone else. This is their purpose for education. So that when they had to, uh, la it was labor concerns. So when they had to have strikes, when they, they needed some workers and they needed them educated. And that's why, at least initially in the South, education was all vocational. Um, because they were like, we need to teach them skills because we're gonna need them in other parts of the country <laughs> to, to take over, right? So there was a, but, but look, what, where I started with this. Yes, yeah, so I was looking for this period where money and philanthropists and education, like none of that was, that there was just some sort of free thing. And I'm like, I backed up to reconstruction and I'm looking at the same thing. The undereducation of poor folks, specifically black folks, uh, for business games. One more question. Oh, okay. Um, thank you for being here. This is like put together a ton of dots for things that I think a lot of people have like mildly understood for a while, but your book is awesome. Um, and regarding like, I wanted to ask a question whether you think that ending corporate like PAC donations and, you know, cleaning up that kind of system in Congress will solve some of these issues or like lead to solutions, but obviously the Supreme Court, like that's not, um, the answer uh, fully, but I was going to ask you what solutions do you think or um, yeah. So let me say because I got like two seconds and I'm long-winded. So let me say uh, one. I think that uh, literally I'm not hysterical. I'm not trying to be hysterical when I say I believe that democracy is 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 in trouble, um, and we've seen it in trouble around education around the country in the United States for quite some time. Actually, I mean I could go into a global thing. We said the the, the World Bank has all this stuff about financing these privatized forms of education in very poor countries. And they'll forgive your debt if you will let video teachers come in and, and replace you know, your teachers. Um, or you will have 100 students, and they're like, they will forgive your debt, so they're, they're using it as, so it's not just in, in the United States, but in the United States, I do believe, um, that, that democracy in, is in trouble and that democracy is the only thing that's gonna push back against this, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the fact that uh, educational access and voting rights, when you look at it, um, go hand in hand. They have since the 1890s and they continue to. When there is free access to voting, there it tends to be access to education. You can find it. It may not always be great, but you can find it. Um, when you see voting under direct attack, education it shrinks, right? And so the, the school boards, the, 
the, we, have, we have suspended democracy in some of our nation's largest educational districts um, and put business people in charge of it. And those business people are Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians. Um, it, it, it is not, <laughs> they, they, it is bipartisan. The ways that people will tell you these government schools need to be dismantled and replaced. Um, the last time they wanted to, uh, last time they authorized, I think it's 2016, the, uh, the Charter School We Love You Act, it's not really its name, but it's basically <laughs> like something like that, like the Charter Schools Support Them and Love Them Act. Um, uh, 365, it, it passed 365 to 14, right? Wealthy people, elite people, rich people, people with access think that dismantling public education makes sense. And at this point, none but poor people and people of color in it. Um, so, so we're a profit center, you know, once again. So again, that's why I began with this, with this mother, grandmother in Chicago. Because it's not that people are not pushing back. It's not that they don't know. Really, everything that's in my book, she said. <laughs> like She knows from her lived experience. And she's been organizing against it, and she's been fighting it for a long time. She, they're just simply too much money being out-organized and outspent. And so one of the things that I'm happy about with the book um, is, is at least giving people some ammunition um, as they organize themselves to fight back. All right, thank you.